No man who has taken time to holistically give himself to the word of God has not proved it that it works. The word of God cannot fail because this is the absoluteness of his power. An open invitation to a life in the word. Because you have received the faith of Christ and you have embraced the righteousness of God through faith. Grace and peace are multiplied. That is why we lay hands on the lame and they walk. We lay hands on the blind and they see. We lay hands on the deaf and they hear. It's powerful enough to give you the answer on its first application. Arise on the wings of revelation. Align your destiny. Transform your world. This is Fenero Make Manifest with Apostle Grace Lubega. Have you ever imagined the circumstance where you're without God in this world? Thank God that you have God. <laughs> you may take your seats. I want you to, to greet your neighbor on the left and on the right and welcome them to the Sunday service. Tell them you're welcome, you're welcome, you're welcome. Yes. It's a blessed experience for us to sit in the company of church family. Because if you think about it, these are the people you're going to be with in heaven. More handsome and more beautiful, but yeah, they're the people you're going to see in heaven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How was your week? Awesome. Yes, I always care to know. Mine as well was wonderful. I want to congratulate those who are getting married that have been announced this afternoon. The rest of you are not yet married. Redeem time. Jesus is about to return. I think I'm joking, but heaven can open here. And you miss out. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Men's conference. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. Not like that. Men's conference. So we're excited for what is going to happen. Biggest men's conference the world has ever seen. Pastor Zach only has said the men. The rest of you are just looking at me. Let me say it again. The biggest men's conference the world has ever seen. Hallelujah. So 10, you write a list of 10 friends. Every man at this level should be able to at least witness or influence 10 people. Hallelujah. For our 10th anniversary. To the glory of his name. And you'll see what God is going to do in your life. Hallelujah, somebody. Allow me to bless our offerings right now and then we get straight into the word. Heavenly Father, we worship you this morning with our giving. Persuaded of your work in our lives and the grace available for us to do big for you. We submit to your will and purposes, continue ordering our steps, working in our lives both to will and to, to, will and to do, according to your good pleasure, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Our uh, teaching this afternoon is entitled, oh sorry, titled Divine Compulsion or the Law of Divine Compulsion. If you're writing notes, you can write the Law of Divine Compulsion and you can put uh, an independent phrase, how God moves hearts to bless you. How God moves hearts to bless you. This is one of those sermons you will have to take time to pray through. You know, there are those sermons you will have to really take time, some time off to yield and exercise your spirit to connect to everything that is being given. Uh, and after service, I'll create some five minutes. After teaching, I mean, I'll create some five minutes for us to really pray through this. And this is one of those things that once someone's that whenever a season opens up for you, you know, I've already said that there are three gates or portals or, or realms that should open to you for access to live in God's best. 
one of those gates is the graces that function through certain men who are anointed distinctly in your age or by the reading of the ancients. When you learn how to open that gate, a lot can come to you. But there's also a gate of principles and patterns to know how to align yourself according to the laws of the spirit. But also, the, the, there is a gate of seasons and times. For every season that opens on your life, there's always a certain experience that God will accord to you to connect to the next phase of your life and to know how to operate or respond in a season is a very important wisdom to carry because some of you don't really have your miracle because when a season, the gates of a certain season open, you don't know how to enter them or you don't know how to open certain gates uh, to provide seasons even when there are no seasons. You know, there's uh, a wisdom in the liberties of the spirit where you can um, communicate to the spirit realm to create a season, your own season. Sometimes the seasons are generic, right? For example, if you live in a time where God is bringing revival, and that's a season of revival, yes, majority of people will leap into that season. But there are people who don't know how to leap into the graces of the season of revival, right? But there are also seasons that a man can command. That a man can open by exercising the liberty that they carry in God. This thing called liberty of the spirit is a very deep thing. That is why the scripture speaks of the man which is planted by, like a tree. The man which is like a tree that is planted by the rivers of water. If you begin from Psalms chapter 1 verses 1, let's read it from there. It says, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. There's a teaching there I might not have time to explain. But we see an experience of walking, standing, sitting. Some of you positionally are seated in the wrong place. You're seated in the seat of the scornful. You're standing in the way of what? Sinners. Or you are walking with the ungodly. That is why you frustrate a lot in your life and you think, ah, it's a curse, I'm dealing with this, somebody bewitched me, no. But you are with the wrong people. Among us are people who are Satanists, agents of the devil, who are either on a mission deliberately from hell to divert the righteous or are in ignorance initiated to function under some order because they were available vessels to hell, you know. Some of you think that those things don't exist or you think they must look as, and sound a certain way. You know, one time Jesus was addressing his disciples and a devil got on Peter. But Jesus could discern that this was a devil. He says, get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me, for thou severest not the things that be of God, but those things that be of men. He had to discern that the person of spirit speaking in Peter, even in his most right meaning, sense was actually of the devil. So some people sit there. They sit with the wrong people. And there's a teaching. Probably I'll teach uh, sometime on that. But in the next verse it says, uh, uh, verses 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord and in the law of the Lord does he meditate day and night. When that man is in that position, verses 3, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth, bringeth forth his fruit in his season and his leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doth he shall prosper. Men who prosper in every season of life have learned to build or command their own seasons. See, we can have a season of prosperity in a nation and it takes great wisdom to open that door to leap into the prosperity of that nation. But if 
but what if that nation is going through an inflation period? It's going through a period of lack and poverty and scarcity. There's still people who by the wisdom of God have learned or can learn to open certain gates that even when the nation is lacking, they have sufficient or more than all they need, not only to be provided or furnished with all their needs and their, their families, but they are able to do big for God and extend their generosity to others. You must know how to leap into the seasons that are generically sent by God in every age, but you must also know sometimes how to create your own season. Because sometimes the generic seasons of God might not provide for what you see in vision, yet the realm of faith and the liberties of the Spirit can provide for you. It's a deep thought. This is for the mature. Some of you think that everything done is in the time of God. No. Not everything you see commanded by man or the faith narratives you see expressed in every dispensation were really in the time and intention of God. I'll give you one example that I believe many of you will connect to. The first miracle of Jesus Christ was not in the time of God to do a miracle. The first miracle recorded in scripture. If you go back and study keenly, they're at the wedding in Cana and these people run out of wine. Mary comes to Jesus in John chapter 2 and says unto him, verses 3, they have no wine. The people are out of wine. And verses 4, Jesus says to her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Question. Listen to the next question. No, the, the next line. My hour is not yet come. Woman, what must I do with this? My hour to start the miracles has not yet come. This, this wasn't the time for Jesus to do a miracle. But there's a woman who commanded a season. There was a woman who commanded a what? A season. And his mother said unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto thee, do it. And Jesus turned water into wine. Not in his time, but in the timing of a woman who knew how to command a season where there was no season. Who knew how to command a provision where there was no provision. So you can actually command provision. You can command a season. It's important for you to note. Hallelujah, somebody. Are you learning something? But back to what I'm, I'm trying to express this afternoon. That when certain seasons come, these are some, this sermon is one of those things you must know how to put on and press through because you can open things. You can open things. You can open things. I want to start this way. If you've been sitting under me for quite some time, you'll agree or appreciate that there are laws that have been set in motion to bless mankind. That there are blessings you will never receive or walk in even though they are available to you by God by reason of your position in Christ until you appropriate some laws, until you set some laws in motion. Okay? And I'll give you an example of the law of seed and harvest. The Bible says, for as long as the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest shall always be available. It's a law that has been set in motion since the ages past. If you don't know how to appropriate that law, you will never increase anything because everything is increased by the principle of seed and harvest. This is a very deep thought. I wish I had time. If I really was to teach about this thing, I would need probably 12 hours of teaching for you to really appreciate the seed and harvest principle. 12 hours of teaching. Because everything that I see increase on the earth is by that seed. How did Adam and Eve become the nations of the world you see? multiplication of seed. The Bible says that a seed abideth alone except it die first. And when it dies and it's planted in the ground, then it sprouts out 
And then the Bible says, it bringeth forth much fruit. John 12 verses 24. Every principle, sorry, every seed carries that principle. But once it's planted and it dies and the germ comes out, it will bring forth much fruit. So everything you want to multiply must submit itself to the law of seed and harvest. It's a very important law. Very important law. The businesses you're building, they must subject themselves to the law of seed and harvests. The marriage that you're cultivating, to build it for it to grow, there has to be a place of seed and harvest. Every aspect of life carries that seed. Now, when you're living in a, you know, especially from, when you're starting from a place of the institutional church, new uh, Pentecostalism and the new age teaching that has crept in unawares in the church, people think seed is only money. That's just one facet of the multi-facets of seeding. All right? When a parent invests time to talk to their child, they're planting a seed. When you sit in a library as a student to study, you are planting a seed. I was sharing with somebody a couple of days ago, a wonderful lady, and we were appreciating how certain societies understand the power of volunteering. Doing for men what they are not able to do back for you. Even the scriptures teach. You know, it's one thing to help a person who will help you. I'm helping this sister because I know she has connected to somebody who will one day also, who she can connect me to and then, you know, give me this advantage that I need in life. But Jesus said or taught us the place of learning to give to men who will never give back to you, who are not able to give back to you. It's a very powerful thing there. When we, as a ministry, every week we are in prisons, we're sowing seeds of hope. And I can gladly tell you, many of the mattresses some of our mothers are sleeping on in a certain prison in this country, it was your giving. You see? You have had the works we have done in northern Uganda. We adopted children that were, were, were you know, left for dead on the streets or in garbage pits and thrown there by their parents and we picked them and we give them food, we give them clothes, we give them, you know, whatever is needed. This is your giving. The street children, we give food every Sunday and many whom we settle with their families and take to school. This is your seeds. Okay. The Bible says in Luke chapter 6 verses 35, he says, love your enemies and do good and lend hoping for nothing again. There are places where you don't hope for somebody to give back to you, but there are seeds. And that's the place of volunteering. That there are people you will help and, and, and not expect anything from them. There's a blessing in there. Me and that person were appreciating places like, nations like the United States of America. These are people who understand the spirit of volunteering. Americans can volunteer. You hear any calamity or catastrophe before them and you hear, oh, there are floods somewhere. In, in, a, in a nation X or in the United States or outside that, you're going to see volunteers coming in, you know, to help resettle people, give them shelter, give them food. That's just who they are. That's what they do across the world. And in part, it explains why it's the richest nation on the face of the earth. They're givers in many aspects. You're going to drive a few kilometers outside this city and just go into a suburb somewhere and find a white lady looking after a child who she's never related to. It's just who they are. Not special. That's special. You know, I celebrate that. So some of you, you think that everything you will do or should do has to expect some pay immediately. And that's not how the kingdom of God works. All of us have sowed seeds. We've all sowed seeds in ways and places that you can never, you know, uh, even be able to apprehend. And I always tell us it's not where you sow, it's what you sow. You reap what? You sow, not where you sow. Sometimes the places you sow your seed are not going to be the places from where you will reap your seed. Okay? There's a person I know who is volunteering for a company. They're not paying you anything. But one day, you will be the wonder, the answer for that company. 
of recent, we have been blessed to be among the biggest givers to Hospice Africa. Okay. Even in COVID, we gave quite some, uh, uh, some amount and we're planning to also send quite a, a big amount there. We're helping this wonderful organization help manage patients or palliative care, people who are in stage four cancer, right? But how does hospice get our help? I'll tell you how it started. When I was a young man, in my first year, we needed the field placement. Every social, work in, social worker, uh, every student uh, in social work and social administration uh, needed to look for a place, of place, uh, for a place to, be, to practice. And I approached hospice and I told them I want to serve here, free of charge. And they, they, with open arms, they welcomed me and they said, come and work with us. And I served hospice free of charge. I went on, 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 on visits. I went in hospitals and I was with them. I gave cycle social support. We wrote wheels. We did everything to the book of any social worker would do free of charge. That was a seed. But I can testify that the anointing to heal cancer came on me when I was attending to cancer patients. You see? Now, hospice could have turned me away. But they gave me the opportunity to serve. And see what God does. More than 10 years later, I'm among the biggest giver to the very organization that allowed me to volunteer. You see, you don't take those things for granted. If hospice had closed its doors to volunteers because, oh, we can't give them food or something like that, then they would have lost the bigger picture. So you never know the things God connects you to. And there are things I received being a volunteer there that money could never buy. There are people here, if you don't give them money, they can't volunteer. That's a sign that you're poor. That's a sign that you're poor. So you can have so much in your life, but still be poor. I've met bankrupt millionaires in dollars. They have all the wealth in the, man, in the world. I mean, you study their heart, they're poor people. They can't give for free and generously. So the law of seed and harvest has always been set in motion by our actions. And whether you want it or not, and there's a time I'll teach about it deeply, it is, it's at work. But this is all as a foundation to help understand this law that I want to introduce to you. The law of divine compulsion. How God compels the hearts of men. That law has been set in motion since time immemorial. It has echoed through the ages. God using men and women as agents to extend his compassion and love, his mercy and his riches to mankind. And you will never or cannot experience God's best if this law is not working to your advantage. So in this sermon tonight, I only want to work, both show you how this law works, but also position you by this wisdom to receive all that this law can give to the glory of God and expansion of his kingdom. Whether you want it or not, one day you're going to find yourself in a place, a circumstance, a situation where you will need the heart of a certain man or woman to be stirred, to advantage you without you seeking their help, without you asking, without you begging, pleading, manipulating, even trying to introduce yourself to them See, all of these things can be done when you're seeking help. You can plead, you can beg, you can stand where they see you, you can manipulate systems and pay yourself into the hearts of men. But there are things, there are experiences, let me use that word, that will happen to you that you have not applied yourself to even used an ounce of effort to connect to. These are the things I'm talking about. I'm talking about that law that will compel a man, stir the heart of a man 
convict a person to do you good. To do you good. Years ago, I was working with a person and they owed me money. They were to pay me money. And my money had delayed. I'd prayed and has disturbed. And I remember one morning after a couple of months being disturbed that my money was not being given. The Lord told me, appropriate this law. And he gave me a prayer to pray. It was in the night. I woke up and I was disturbed that my money wasn't, you know, paid. And I, I, this was then in the primal years of learning how this law works. How to appropriate the law of divine compulsion. And I remember I made a prayer. The certain words the Spirit gave me to utter. And I uttered them. This person calls me very early in the morning. Should have been 6 or 7 a.m. Very early earlier than they have ever called me before. And this person said, the whole night I was being tormented to pay your money. <laughs> I'm laughing at the devil now. See, you cannot be robbed. Tell your neighbor, I cannot be robbed. Nor taken for granted. In this instance, this person wasn't seeking to rob me. They just kept forgetting and postponing my need. But the devil can walk through those things too. This person woke up in the morning and said, I'm tormented the whole night. I want to pay you. Come. Ede Emma is at the desk being paid all my money. Some of you need such a law. There's somebody right now. You don't need to rebuke any devil. You don't need to speak to any spirit. You just need to activate the law of divine compulsion. To advantage you today to remind the people that must be reminded for your progress. Hallelujah. I'll give you another story and then I'll get straight into scripture examples. I gave this story a couple of years ago. There's many things I've had in life that have really projected this experience. But you love this story for some of you who never heard it. One of those days I was going to ministry and I get to the airport into a nation to, to, to go to a certain nation to preach and I get to the check-in counter late. I should have been the last person. And what hurt me most was that I was unfairly treated. And this is why I say I was unfairly treated. Yes, I was late. To some extent, it wasn't my fault because I don't know how to predict the traffic of Uganda. In Uganda, traffic can happen anywhere. Somebody can actually think you're lying. You agree? You tell a person, I'm, I'm just at the corner, and you're really at the corner. But you sit at that corner for 30 minutes. Somebody say, but why are you a liar? Why would you lie to me? See? But also, another critical mind could say, and rightly, that, but if you knew that there was traffic, you should have prepared and moved earlier. And you're right. But that day, I didn't move earlier, maybe. But I tried. So I reached this counter, and there's a white gentleman ahead of me who is going on the same flight as well. He's checked in, I, and then he, you know, they stamp and give him his boarding pass and go. Some, the last person behind, I come in, I put, in, I put my, my passport on the desk. This fellow looks at it, and then looks at me, and he says checking is closed. Oh yes. The last person they've checked in is going to the next check-in. But he says check-in is closed. He's just given boarding passes to another fellow. So I look at this man and I notice something. He has a black mark on his head. And this black mark I could perceive was a sign I, I see a, a few Muslim brothers carry. They call it, we call it Swigida. It's, it's one of those signs or marks that you see on an individual, for those of you who understand Islam, that this person is a very prayerful person. Now, I also must put a disclaimer here that not all Muslims are bad people. Some of the closest friends I have are Muslims. 
and I can happily tell you there are very wonderful people in there. But this one was functioning under another spirit. Seriously, a fellow has just passed and I'm here trying to check in and you're telling me that check-in is closed. So he tells me check-in is closed. So I could discern there was a spirit disturbing, hindering my entrance into another nation. Now I was dealing with a principality. You know, some of you, when we're talking about principalities, you don't understand how these territorial spirits work. I have had or experienced some resistances when I'm entering certain nations and I could tell that it is because I'm entering a certain nation. I've dealt with principalities before. I've seen them in my dreams. I've seen them in my visions. Some of them I've had to have open encounter spiritual warfare when I'm entering a nation. There was a time I was flying into a certain nation and we had a very bad turbulence. You know those turbulences where even, you know, <laughs> Some people scream and you think, oh God, Armageddon, the end of the world is here. Remember one of those, this plane is going through bad turbulence and, you know, some, the tea spilled on them and some fell. I mean, the, 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 the waiters, the hostesses fell and it was a really bad experience. And I'm asking God, what's happening? What's happening? And the spirit tells me, this is an attack. This spirit doesn't want you to enter this nation X. So, because me, I'm never bothered about turbulence. I'm the kind who could sleep. You ask those who travel with me. I, we could have the worst turbulence and I'm just... Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and I'm gone. I have no care in the world. That's me. And you're traveling with some people and you see some people, Ripata, Kuzi, Kalata, Utida, Zanza, Zanza. <laughs> In fact, I remember one we were traveling with. She, I, she, she turns in one of those turbulences, not this one. Then she turns and looks at me and sees a peaceful person. He's like, if a person grace is okay. And he's in this plane. Let me also do my business. <laughs> Glory to God. So I was not bothered. But I discerned in my spirit there was something. And the Spirit of the Lord gave me a certain utterance. And I uttered that utterance. And the plane, in just seconds, steal and were flying straight. So I knew we were entering some interesting territories. So I've seen those things many times. Many times. I even remember one time I was entering a certain country. I was supposed to fly to a certain country. And you know, somebody says, um, we are gatekeepers. We'll not let him in. And indeed, we had challenges. You know, the flight was supposed to take somehow. They said, we're not flying or the plane is dead or something like that. And I knew this was a spiritual war. Man, the prayer we made and then we get on the next flight to take and we had another turbulence. But I'm Apostle Grace. <laughs> you know? So, we could tell that certain principalities were fighting our entrance into a nation. These things happen. I've been serving God for more than 20 years. I can tell when it's not just a natural turbulence. And there are some which are just natural. I can know and ah, let me just slip through, I know. But there are some I have to command things. So this was one of those things I knew the devil wanted in, for sure to hinder me from going to that nation to preach. So when this man refuses to check me in, I just bow my head like this. And I think he's thinking, what is he doing? I'm praying, I'm saying, God, this spirit can't hinder me from preaching. Something must be done to counter this. And as I was praying in the spirit, a woman comes from nowhere, comes to the counter, asks this young man, why haven't you checked this man in? Very tough. So I'm looking at this woman like this. Then she starts venting. You know, some of you are unfair. They say, my white man was just being checked in. I've been seeing this young man. He's coming on time. He's coming on time. I'm thinking, hmm, who is this woman trying to fight for me? I'm going to call your superiors. I'm going to quarrel with your supervisors. This is not right. Ha, 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 ha. And when she starts quarreling, I remember Exodus 14, 14. I shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. I just stepped aside like this. I stepped aside and just observed, crossed my hands. And this woman went on on and on, venting. Ah, 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 ah. You are not fair. This airline is rubbish. How can you do this? No. So the man tells her, you try to put your, your voice down, madam. No, why should I keep quiet? Ah, ah, ah. 
I'm watching like this, the Lord fighting for me. So this man says, okay, 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 madam, madam, calm down, calm down, calm down. We're going to work on him. She's not an employee. No, I could work on him, madam. Come down, come down, come down. See? Okay, give me your passport. Give me your passport. Put in your passport. So when I put in, the woman is like, <sighs> she's bleeding hard like a rabid dog, ready to attack somebody. <laughs> Check him in. So this guy gets my passport. He's looking on. Don't call our supervisor. Don't, please. And now I see another humble person. You know, sometimes you should learn to give time, you know. We are not bad people, but... So, you're flying. Oh, where? Is it going to... Already the demeanor has changed. Guy checks me in. Gives me my boarding pass. And this woman says, Let me carry for you your bag, sir. Now, during that time, Fanero had not really... It wasn't the phenomenon. I don't even remember like we had begun yet, so... She carries my bags and then I check in and then I go through and she's carrying and I'm, I'm walking like a king. May it happen to you also! In Jesus' name. So I'm walking like a king, she carries my bags. And then she tells me, bye. Hmm. God sent an angel. You see? The law of divine compulsion worked to my advantage that if this fellow who was to check me in refused, God was going to provoke somebody whom he can say no to. Because the words this woman spoke, I couldn't speak. That's what Isaiah 43 verses 4 says. He says, I will give men for thee and people for thy life. And that's my heart's prayer for you this afternoon. That may God appoint people for, for, for you and for your life. I believe that there are people somewhere in the world, somewhere in the world, who are appointed for your advantage. Shout amen if you receive it. There's a man right now going to go for an interview tomorrow morning or next week. And there's five people on the panel. And there are three people appointed by the devil against you. It doesn't matter how much credentials you have. When you stand on that table for the interview, somebody will look at you and you look like a thief. You look like you're not serious. And they'll cancel you. Not because you don't match their merit but because the law of divine compulsion is not working to your advantage. But there's another man going to stand before that meeting tomorrow and they will look at you and love you immediately. They will look at you even before you mention a word. Psalms 18 verses 44. The Bible says, as soon as they hear me, they shall obey me and strangers shall submit themselves unto me let me pray again that may people obey your dream the moment they hear you and may strangers submit themselves to you in jesus name the law of divine compulsion you see the spirit is moving already these are not small things Things are happening in the spirit realm. So whatever you see happening, it's the work of the spirit. It's the work of the spirit. Don't interrupt God. Just keep focused on the message. If God is working on a person. Let him work on them. Keep here. Let the ushers do their job. You keep here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But when I learned that a man, you can walk into a committee and somebody's already said to do you good. You can stand before a council and somebody is already set to do you good. You can put your application for a contract to a project and somebody is already set to do you good. I realize that every child of God should know how to set this law in motion. And this afternoon, we are setting something in motion for you. 2024 is going to be a year where you're going to be announced 
in places that people least expect where you are going to have such a visibility to introduce you in the people or among the people that really matter without you saying a word without you making any application without you trying to explain yourself they shall seek to do you good somebody say i receive it in jesus name it's gonna work have we not said or has not the lord spoken to us that this is the year of priestly consecration this is the year where our altars must speak this is the year where your prayers the seeds that you have planted in prayer for years are going to come and minister plowmen and vine dressers are going to come to your advantage simply seeking to do you good the bible says in isaiah 61 verses 5 and strangers shall stand and feed your flocks and the sons of the alien shall be your plowmen and your vine dressers the bible says you shall be named the priests of the lord <laughs> every person ordained in the office of the priest has people set for your advantage Selah, 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 Matara Bradega Sumbra Lekata, Ki Bradega Zala. The Bible says, You shall eat of the riches of the Gentiles. In their glory, the Bible says, Shall you boast? As a man glories, you shall receive advantage. As they are promoted, you shall be promoted. As they are added to, they shall think of a portion to send to your account. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I'll give you a story. Some of us know. In the book of Esther, we have very interesting accounts. Very interesting accounts. And one of which is a story of a man, an Agagite called Haman. Haman was favored by the king, promoted, and advanced in a seat above all the princes that were with him by a king called Success. Or some versions call him Ahasuerus, depending on whichever version you're reading. So he was a favored man. He knew how to serve the king. And because of that, everybody bowed to him. Everybody bowed to him. People paid obeisance to this figure that the king had elevated. Because when, because when kings elevate, men advantage you. So, he notices a man called Mordecai. And Mordecai refused to bow to Haman. Esther 3 verses 5. The Bible says, when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. Haman was angry because Mordecai refused to bow to him. Everybody, like I said, paid obeisance. But Haman, sorry, Mordecai refused to bow to Haman. So he's disturbed. He becomes enraged against all Jews because Mordecai, refused to bow to him. The Bible says he sought to destroy all the Jews throughout the kingdom of Hazarus, even of Mordecai, because of one man's disobedience. Okay? So you'd ask, why is a man the king has chosen to honor not honored by Mordecai the Jew? And I'll tell you why. Because by design, or pattern, Mordecai was never to bow to Haman. In fact, no seed of Jacob, Israel, was to bow to Haman. So you'd ask, were they rebelling against order? Because we know the Bible says that obey the king because of your vows with God. But this was no ordinary king. Haman harbored the spirit of old that had set itself against the seed of Israel from the ages past. 
and I'm going to show you this mystery in a short while. There's always been a war from the beginning of the earth. There's two spirits that have always been against each other. And that is the spirit of God and the spirit of Satan, the evil one. It's the war between your spirit and your flesh. Why the Bible says that the flesh wars against or lusteth against the spirit and the spirit lusteth against the flesh. That war has begun since time memorial. You remember when Cain killed Abel? Why did Cain kill Abel? The first murder recorded in scripture. It was because a man worshipped God right. And there was a spirit that set itself against that man. You see that war between Ephraim and Manasseh. You see that war between Jacob and Esau. And you see that war ensue through the ages till 2024. That invisible yet powerful war still exists between the righteous and the wicked. But it's hidden because they are all seeds of Abraham. Later on when you look at Jacob and, 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 and what? And who? Esau. They're all from that lineage of Abraham, the man of faith. Hallelujah. In David's time, there was a man who gave him a hard time. He was called Doeg. If you study the roots of Doeg and the man that actually fought him most, you realize that Doeg was a seed of Esau. It's amazing. Years later, but this seed is still appropriated. The war is still taking place. If you study the time of Jesus, there's a king that sought to kill the firstborns. I mean, the, the young boys are in the age bracket of when Jesus was born, Herod. You study history, and Herod is a descendant of Esau. Isn't it amazing? In the time of Esther, you study this man called Haman. And Haman is a seed of Agag. He was an Agagite. And Agagites are sons of the Amalekites. And the Amalekites are sons of Esau. Now you see why the seed in Mordecai could not submit itself to the seed that was at work in Haman. And why Haman had to hate Mordecai. Even if Mordecai had sought peace, the spirit on Haman had always wanted or sought to fight the seed. So some of you, the people fighting you, have very ancient spirits on them. Some of the pastors fighting you, ministers fighting you, are not fighting you from yesterday. There's a spirit that is so old and at work. It's just expressing and continuing through these individuals. Some people who are fighting you at your workplace have not started fighting you last week because of this job. That spirit of Esau is disturbing. Spirit of Esau is disturbing. It's always existent in every situation, in every generation. And it takes its cost to fight against the righteous. So now you understand why Mordecai could not bow to Haman. Because he saw that on Haman was a certain spirit. It was a certain spirit. Hallelujah. Now, Haman thinks, I need to destroy these Israelites. This Jew. He goes to the king and convinces him, there are people here who don't agree with your laws. They do things differently. They, they're indifferent. They're strange. If they're not destroyed, this kingdom is in trouble. Remember, the king loves who? Haman. So he com Haman convinces this king for a decree to destroy all the people that are not submitted fully to this idol that Haman has created in himself. Now, in the same period, Esther chapter 6, 
when Haman and Zeresh, his wife, and the few wise men around him are building to conspire to destroy the children of Israel, this same law <laughs> was appropriated. One night, the king is asleep. And the Bible says he lost sleep. He lost sleep. Why did he lose sleep? Because there is a law that was appropriated by a man who was praying somewhere. And the Bible says he commanded the book of records to be brought, a book of chronicles, diary. He could have done anything, but that day, he was compelled. He could have said, bring me this, bring me tea, bring me some berries to eat. But that day, the right instruction comes in the heart of the king. And he says, bring me a book of records. Read it for me. So his scribes are reading a book. And therein, he lands on a story on Mordecai. One day, the king had two eunuchs, Bictana and Teresh. They were his chamberlains. They were keepers of the door, the king's door. But one day they transpired to kill the king. Mordecai overheard them discussing the plot. By the way, it's amazing how God protects the kings. Anybody with a kingly grace, there's a protection on your life. That's why the Bible says, say not a king against the, say not a thing against the king. At least that which that has wings shall carry it. And that which uh, has a voice or a bird in the air shall take it to him. A bird in the air or that which carries wings, that's the Holy the Spirit, shall tell the matter to the king. Every man with a kingly grace has that protection on their lives. I don't know how it works, but when somebody turns against me, I know, I just know. I may laugh with them, continue playing with them, but I know that this person's heart is already against me. I know it. Every king should have it, should carry that consciousness. You cannot hate me and I don't know. I just don't tell you. I can know and say, there's something wrong with this individual. That's how the king works. That's the grace. The Bible says, a bird of the air shall carry the voice and that which has wings shall tell. The bird of the air here means an, an angelic. An angel will carry it or somebody will tell him or the spirit will tell him. God will use the agency of a man to be where you're planning to conspire. And it will get back to that man that they're planning to conspire. This is what happened with Mordecai. He picked something because God wouldn't let that king die. There was something he was supposed to do for Israel. So Haman, I mean Mordecai picks it and tells the king. The king thanked him, but nothing was done for Haman that day. This is interesting for you to know. Nothing was done for Haman that day. Because for a truth, some of you, the seeds you have sowed for the salvation of many might not spring forth this week. They might not come next year. They might not come next month. But there's a record written for every seed you have sowed for the good of the kingdom. For the good of the kingdom. That is why I want people, when you sit in the seat of the scorner, the Bible says you become a scorner. When you sit around people who are discussing another brother, the Bible says you are one with them. Avoid sitting next to tell bearers because you're as bad as the person who is telling, because you're listening. There are people, once you start discussing them, I'll stand and walk away. I'll excuse myself. A phone will go on. Somehow I'll find a phone call. I'll find something to do. Because I don't want to be found in certain judgments. That's just how life is. Some of you are pausing your life because you're sitting in the wrong conversations. So, Mordecai had done his part, sowed the seed. That's one way of sowing. But did he reap it immediately? No. He didn't reap it immediately. So some of you have planted seeds past. But you have not yet seen them manifest. It's okay. The point is, one day that seed will speak. And activate the law of divine compulsion when you have not spoken anything. And probably it might find you sleeping. And the man will wake up and say, mm, this person did me good. So the Bible, that's why the Bible says that do, do not get tired of doing good. Do not grow weary of well-doing. 
For in due season, the Bible says, ye shall reap if you faint not, if you faint not, if you faint not. That's why I said if we teach seed, it's a deep thing. I shared in the first service and I told people, some of us, the seeds we have planted that many of you will never know because when a farmer is planting a seed, it has to be hidden in the ground. That's one principle underlying planting. You don't tell your seed. And if you're looking in a field and a man is planting a seed, you're looking a couple of meters away, you just see a man walking in the field. But really he's what? Planting. Because usually there is no visibility to this realm. And if a man seeks the visibility in that realm, then that man will not have a harvest. That is why the Bible says, what your right hand does, let your left hand not know. But there are seeds some of us have planted that a tabloid can't take us down. I don't care how much they fund it. It can go down, but a tabloid can't take Loretta Grace down. No video on YouTube or Facebook can take me down. Because they need to go and dig so many seeds out, which actually have already sprouted into fruit. That's why some of you or us should not worry about unnecessary noises. Some of you, you're always worried about who is talking about you, who is accusing you falsely, because there are people who will always believe them, and there are people who will hear you when you say nothing. Because your seeds speak. The Bible says you shall know them by their fruit. When the Bible speaks of knowing a man by his fruit, you must understand there was a seed he sowed. You understand what I'm saying? I gave an example once, I remember one day, I set out to go and wash clothes for old people to preach the gospel. We washed clothes, cleaned their houses. You tell an old, old lady, Mama, I want to help you. You look and she thinks, Maybe this is a thief. You say, okay, let me, let me clean your veranda. But some of them were too poor. You couldn't steal anything. So they would know, ah, no. Maybe something is up with this person. You go cleaning their veranda. You wash their clothes. You teach, teach, preach about God. Ah, you know, before you're done, they're gone again. Some of them refuse. I remember this old lady, Muslim lady. Oh my God. I paid some fees for her kids. I cleaned her home. I remember one day I even learned painting through her house. <laughs> I went painted, you know, you're teaching. This lady didn't receive Jesus. She fell sick. Her nephews and nieces, her grandchildren were there. Sorry, her grandchildren, not nephews, nieces. Her grandchildren used to look after her and they were all Muslim. I remember I gave all the bill of, it, of, of, of this woman's sickness, hoping she would come back and receive Christ. When she came back, she came back demented. There was dementia. God told me, still look after her. I said, sending money looking after this woman. And then she died. I footed that whole bill. And after her death, I start looking back, and some of these grandchildren had received Christ. So hey, I was sowing for, <laughs> for them, not this old woman. You see, now, how can such a man be brought down by a YouTube video? You understand what I'm saying? A, a TikToker, a, 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 a social influencer, social commentator, you can't. Because you need to pay a heavy price to break some foundations. Some of you, some people think they can break you. They can't. Because they need to go through many orphans you have looked after. The Bible says if you look after the poor, the Bible says, God shall not let you. He, will, he says, he shall deliver you in the time of trouble. Psalms 41. And the Bible says, he shall not, he shall not let you to the will of your enemies. Because breaking Fenero, you're meaning that these street children won't eat. You understand? Eh? Are you going to feed them when you break it? Read Psalms 41. He says, he that considereth the poor, the Lord will deliver him in time of trouble. The Lord will preserve him and keep him alive and he shall be blessed upon the earth and you'll not deliver him into the will of his enemies. Some of you, you could have been destroyed, but God remembered the child you're paying fees for. Your cousin's children that you're raising in your own house. And he said, uh-uh. Touch another person because these children need a mother. Some of you, disease, disease came into your body and God said no. Disease has to wait because she has a great responsibility 
There is a seed that is crying to me about this man or this woman. That's why I say do not stop doing good. Because one day the seed you give to that orphan might be the one screaming loud saying, uh uh, don't touch David. Touch anybody else, but not this person. He says, even in your bed of languishing, he will make your bed in, his sick in your sickness. Why? Because you remember the poor. So you have to unpack many layers. You seem to destroy ministry, and God remembers the people who are saved every Thursday and Sunday. And He says, Well, will you pastor them? No. Lubega, keep standing. You understand? That's just how the gospel works. Because you're not going to pastor them. No, if you couldn't pastor them before, you can't pastor them on, by a small video you make on Zoom. No, you can't. You're not, you're not going to win their hearts. You get my point? So some of you should understand that your seeds are speaking. Your seeds are speaking. Your seeds are speaking. The law of divine compulsion will compel. How did you come to this church? How, did I call you? Did I buy you a gift? No. But there's something that compelled you under this anointing. You're sitting in the heat. It's hot. You're squeezed. But hey, that's where you come. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a law that compels you to come and sit under this anointing. That's not my work. It's the work of God. And I stand on this altar every day with reverence and grace and fear. Because I know that it's not me doing this. It's God doing this. Because he needed to build something. You understand what I'm saying? So sometimes when I see things come at me, I remember the seeds we sowed when they were not there. And I, I don't get worried. Because they, they need to literally go back in my vineyard and unpluck every seed for every plant first. And they can't because they don't know the way there. <laughs> The Bible says there is a place which the fowls cannot go, which the eagle's eye cannot see, the vulture's eye has not seen. They don't know how to do it. So like Mordecai, some of you did things back in the day. You did them for your uncles. You did them for your aunties. You did them for some orphan. You did it for a certain poor child. You did it for somebody else's daughter. And maybe you were not appreciated. Some of you were fired by the very bosses you tried to help. Some people are too good that when you try to be good, people start to suspect you, you, you're planning something. You should just naturally a good person. And they might look at you and see nothing improved on you. But don't worry. There is a time a Haman will jump on you. And the king somewhere will lose sleep for your advantage. Somebody say, love divine compulsion. Work in my life. This is what happened. So, as the king is being told to destroy, or as they seek to tell or convince the king to destroy, that very king is awakened. And I tell people never take light when the Bible says that the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and as the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Here king, I'm not only talking about people with physical kingdoms. I'm talking about everybody who has the power to make a person or contribute to a person as they become. That's a king. That's your king. That's why in the, in the world we have something called king makers. We have people, the moment you come in contact with them, your life will change. Those people are not many, but they're there. There's a person, the moment you come in contact with them, you got a job, you got a car, you got a house, your children are studying because you came in contact with that person. Before, you had nothing. You did everything in the world, but there was no grace for you to be able to translate. But when you meet that person, advantage comes. You never take those people for granted. Because there is a seed of greatness. Because the king, every king has a seed of greatness that is able to interpret another man's dream. Those people are not many. Even in the pastoral, I've been around ministers, but there are ministers who can multiply grace on others. And there are ministers who can't multiply what's upon their lives. Okay? That's the essence of giving birth. That's the essence of bringing forth. There are people, when you sit under them, when you listen to them, when you listen to their counsel, there is just no way you cannot prosper. It's not possible. It's not possible. 
When I look at some of these people now who are pastors in the ministry, I remember them, the pastor Brian's putting on uh, slippers in university. Very smart boys looking for a destiny. And their wives who have pastored since. But when I see that progress and, and I see them become wonderful men and women and they, they can afford to do this and that, it brings joy to me. And let me tell you something. Every Christian has that grace. We are just not yet awakened and enough to appropriate it because every believer has that grace. The Bible says you've been made kings and priests to the most high God. What does that mean? That you're a king maker because you are a king. Every Christian has that potential. It's not with a few special people. Look at David. You remember David? David lived in a time where nobody believed in him. And the Bible says, he went and looked for the most distressed, most indebted men, most indifferent people, most discontented. Everyone that was confused, he gathered them. And the Bible says he became captain over them. 400 men. That's how he built his army. But the scriptures tell you at the end of the age of David, when he's in his old age, it is testified that it is these 400 men that built the kingdom. It's these 400 men that gave most for Israel. It's these 400 men that brought order in a nation. The most broken pieces met the right captain and became the most constructive and distinctive vessels. Broken, but with a dream and a vision. They just needed to sit under the right anointing. And they were going to be translated. It's a lot. And to know that it's on your life. Everybody who comes under your influence will be advantaged. Will be advantaged. Never estimate a kingmaker. There's a person in the world right now. If you meet them, your finances will change. If you meet them, you'll get married. If you meet them, get married. Oh yeah, oh yeah. If you meet them, your ministry will change. If you meet them, your vision will be aligned. If you meet them. If you meet them. When you meet them. They'll give you or add to you something that you could never construct on yourself or in your own ability. Your potential was not enough to build, but they can call it out. They're midwives. You understand what I'm saying? As a pastor, there are people I know who can't listen to anybody in the world. But when I call them, they humble. <laughs> if they left this cover, they'll become wild. And I believe every pastor can attest to that. You always have those people who can listen to you, but they can't listen to anybody. You see, every believer has that. You must ask God for the wisdom to be aware of it, to awaken to its full potential, so you should touch this world. You should influence this world. You should leave this world a better place because you came. You were born as an individual, but let me prophesy, you'll die as an institution. In Jesus' name. Many shall come out of you. That's how the Bible has designed your life to be. He told Abraham, I will make thee exceeding fruitful. Can he be exceeding fruitful without a seed principle? No. And he told him, and I will make men, sorry, nations of thee. I will make nations of thee. And he told him, and kings shall come out of you. Kings shall come out of you. Let's do a prophetic utterance right now. Put your hand on your stomach and say, I decree and I declare that kings come out of my loins. Kings come out of my gift. Kings come out of my assignment. Kings come out of my vision. And I will make great nations. In Jesus' name. That's a very powerful word. I can imagine what that looks like in the next 100 years if Jesus is not yet back. Do you know what has just been appropriated? 
Am I seeing somebody's great great grandchild become the president of a certain nation? Am I seeing somebody's daughter become the president of the UN? Or am I seeing somebody's child sit in World Health Organization and discuss the next health policy for an organization? Am I seeing the most influential ministers, the most influential engineers and doctors coming out of somebody's womb this evening? Am I seeing? Patara bradega zombre ke telepa. That is why the Bible says that I've been young and now I'm old. I have never seen a righteous man forsaken and I have never seen their seed begging bread. That is why I decree to every parent at the sound of my voice, your children will not be survivors. They will not be victims of the times. They will not be frustrated in the age. I decree and I declare, your children shall not beg bread. In every nation your children go, they shall be for signs. They shall be for wonders. Isaiah 69 verses 5. And their offspring, listen, and their offspring shall be known among the nations. Their offspring shall be known among the nations. And the Bible says, all who see them in their prosperity, read the Amplified Version, all who see their offsprings in their prosperity shall recognize and acknowledge that they are the people whom the Lord has blessed. They'll look at your daughter and say, mm, this girl is blessed. They'll look at your son and say, mm, this boy is blessed. They'll look at your children's children and say, mm, this child is blessed. Even to the barren, you shall bring forth because your womb is blessed. Somebody shout hallelujah. Woo! Our children shall not give into drugs. No. It shall not be seen to 40, 60 years later that that was a pastor's daughter and she's somewhere on the street addicted to cocaine, dying under the hand of the devil. Our children, listen, even for the mothers who are watching and your children are losing it, we call them back into the fold. May the law of divine Work on them. May it work on them. May it compel them. May it stir their hearts. May it call back your son. Who, there's a lady, your child is confused in her gender. There's a, there's a man, your son is in drugs. May, may this law of divine compulsion there's a woman, your son, your children are not talking at you, to you anymore. They, the devil has set you against. There's a man, your children no longer want to do anything with you. May this very law be activated this afternoon. There's a woman or man watching me right now, but your child is in some trouble. It's a health trouble. It's a financial trouble. It's, it's some trouble. Isaiah 65, 23 says, they shall not bring to labor in vain and bring forth children for sudden terror and calamity. Our children shall not see calamity. Our children shall not see terror. Your children are far from accidents. They are far from those bullets that fly. Those arrows of wickedness. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. The law of compulsion will bring them home. The love compulsion will bring them to church. The love compulsion will align them to character. The love compulsion will force them to obey you. In Jesus mighty name, we are praying. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Let's finish this. Hallelujah. Whoever is in the position of a king in the world, they're going to be stirred. They're going to be stirred. To advantage or be advantaged. 
in the name of Jesus. Some might not be godly. They might even not be believers of God, but they carry the seed of greatness in them enough to make a man be. That's a king. The Bible speaks in Ezra chapter 1 verses 1 as the prophetic utterances of Jeremiah were echoed and affirmed. The Bible says in the first year of Cyrus, the king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred, listen to the word, the Lord stirred the spirit. He stirred the spirit of Cyrus, the king of Persia, a pagan god, that he made a proclamation through all his kingdom and put it also in writing saying, now thus saith the Cyrus, the king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and he has charged me. This is God telling a pagan king to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Oh, 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 oh. I see in the name of Jesus that even the people who you have no numbers of or who you saw didn't know you are going to receive definitive instructions to do you good according to the purpose of God. This is what happened with Cyrus. That as it was spoken in Ezra chapter 1 from verses 1 to verses 2, so shall it be said of you that God convicted a certain king to fulfill the prophetic utterance that you have made or are making this afternoon to build your vision, to build your dream, to fund your affair in Jesus' name, to the glory of the kingdom. This is not for selfish motive. This is for the good of man. There's a king dreaming for you. There's a man who's going to wake up and only your face will be before his mind. Your name will be mentioned countlessly in the heart and they will come to you and say how do i help you i feel i want to do you good but i don't know how somebody receive it in jesus name the bible says Daniel was preferred above all the princes. Daniel was preferred. Yes, they love, but they will prefer you. They will prefer you. Their hearts will prefer you. And he was preferred above, the Bible says, presidents and princes. He was preferred. And the Bible says, and the king sought to set him over all his realm, the whole realm. Men will seek to set you as CEOs over these organizations, as presidents over these institutions, as leaders over these masses, not by power, not by might. They will say, people will say everything negative and the man will hear it and still say, I want her. Yes, she has many children. She has children out of wedlock, married four men, but that's the one I want. Yes, he has a bad history. Maybe he has a criminal record from prison, but he's the one I want. He's ambiguous, he's divergent, but I still want him. He's my choice. She's unfit. She's not as educated, he's not as qualified, but I prefer him above all credentials. This is going to happen beginning 2024. It's going to be accelerated on your life in Jesus' name. It's like the place of giving. Have you ever asked yourself why in this ministry we don't compel, coerce, manipulate people to give? And do you know Fanero is one of the ministries that really gives big? I have some of the biggest givers here you've ever met. Why? Because God has to star. He has to compel them. When I ask God, I ask for spirit-led partners. 
not people I have to twist to do something. And they come and say, Papa, what can we do? By their own will. And I tell them, this needs to be done. The lights need to be fixed. And somebody does the bill without manipulation. They don't even want their names to be mentioned. They're not even seated in front because they don't want special seats, but they're special to me because they are sent and compelled by God. In Exodus, if you recall scripture, let me give you one last scripture. In Exodus 35, the scriptures tell us when God had spoken through Moses that Israel was to build a temple, a tent, sorry, of meeting for God. The Bible says, New Living Translation, let's read the New Living Translation, verses 21. All, listen, whose hearts were stirred and whose spirits were moved came and brought the sacred offerings to the Lord. They brought all the materials needed for the tabernacle, which was a tent of meeting, for the performance of its rituals and for the sacred garments. Both men and women came, all whose hearts were willing, and they brought to the Lord their offerings of gold, brooches, earrings, rings from their fingers and necklaces. They presented the gold objects, every kind of a special bring to God. Moses didn't say, those who have a million shillings, stand here. Moses didn't say, I feel God tell me that there's 75 people here with $1,000 now. He just mentioned the vision of God. And there are men who had hearts stirred. And let me tell you again, I say this as a proud pastor, that people in, what? Somebody asked me, how much do you pay people to go to the street? How much can you pay a person to go and preach Jesus? I can't pay anybody to do that. But we, take, we talk about street preaching. Ministers come. Doctors come. Engineers come. A group of people flew from Malaysia. One was a wife to the deputy speaker of parliament. Some, one of the best surgeons, heart surgeons in the country. One was the most prolific professors in the university. And they were at Java House, Kamocha, preaching the gospel. How much money can I pay such people? If you learn how the hearts of men are compelled, you'll stop competing with any man and do your part. Plant your seed. Set your laws in motion. You'll not compete with a neighbor because they're selling more in the next gate. No. You'll simply keep to your, soul, to your seed. You, you'll sow seeds of positive confirmation, conf affirmation. You'll, confessing right is, is, a, is planting the right seeds. Some of you, you look at your business and say, oh, my business is failing. I don't think I'm going to be a success. Oh, you've planted. But there's a man who wakes up every morning and say, this business is a success. Yes, they're indebted, but they're still a family. What the word of God says. You can't compete with such a man because he set this law in motion years ago. Some of the things we're seeing now, this thing you're seeing, we set, I set it by, I set some laws in motion more than 13 years ago. You haven't even yet seen what I'm setting now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Some of the things you, you're moving in now, they were set when you were 20. What you're setting now, they've not yet seen. And they're about to see. Yes, you come in church. People don't see change yet on your life. That's okay. You look stupid and just keep your course. A time will come when the sheep will turn. And they won't be able to ignore you. Do you know there are people here. You're going to enter a phase where people can't. Even if they choose to ignore you, they can't. Because your works are speaking. Your creations are expressed in such a way that even the biggest enemy cannot ignore that surely there is something working on that woman's life. There is something working on that man's life and it's not ordinary. It is so, shall be so, and not otherwise. So the Lord stirred their spirits. He stirred their hearts to give. God can stir people to bless you. Set the law in motion. Set the law in motion. That's why I said, this is one of those sermons whenever you feel a season is opening. Switch it on and press through it. Every gate that's open before you for advantage will carry its full course from inception to delivery and or bringing forth. You'll not have miscarriages. You'll not cast off your fruit before it's time. 
Have you seen a tree that carries a fruit and that fruit falls off before it's mature? You'll not experience that. That's why the Bible says in Malachi 3.18 that you'll not cast off your fruit before the time in the field. Everything will come right. That means every opportunity will come with the right preparation for you to enjoy God's best in every season. You won't lag behind or come short of anything in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, allow me to get to you to, you to your feet and let us in five minutes activate something. As I do that, there are people right now watching me online. We have more than 605, 605 branches watching and some are watching on television, on Manifest Television. Some of you are watching on YouTube. Some of you are watching on Facebook. Some of you are watching, uh, I mean, in the streaming centers with your neighbor. Some of you are here. Some of you are watching from across the world. This is a person, it's your first time to tune in and this was your message. You were just going through YouTube and just found yourself stuck on this message. God has spoken. If you're there and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you're watching or you're here in this room auditorium or outside in the overflow and you want to receive Jesus. As we are praying, I'm going to ask you to come forth. I want to pray with you and uh, lead you into a confession prayer to acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus on your life. I believe everybody who's supposed to be born again has been convinced. I'm not going to speak any words to convince any further than what God has convicted in your heart to do. Come. The rest of us, let us open our mouth and just speak. Create something. Create something. Create something. Speak in other tongues. Raise your voice and pray. I want to hear you pray. I know a God whose mercy full and kind faithful and gracious I'm the apple of his eye the thought that fills his heart every morning, noon, and night. He loved me when I didn't care. He was patient till I came running back into his heart. Look how he turned my life around Made me a shining star His glory to reveal Come on, let's pray I will worship him forever Love him forever Because this God is too good Worship him forever, love him forever because this God is true. Don't look too far to see how good he is. Just look. Took me from the merry clay, set my feet upon the rock, and standing in his righteousness. Oh, oh, he took away my sin and shame, gave me a brand new name. He's beloved and he's Shining star, His glory to reveal. I will worship Him forever, love Him forever, because this God is too good. I worship Him forever.
vision he has placed on your life as he compels you also to do according to his good pleasure for the Bible says for it is God which worketh in us both to will and to do according to his good pleasure his good pleasure clap your hands to Jesus come on celebrate Jesus Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Now, those of you who are here and you've come to receive Jesus, I have a through children from the ghetto who are there. Pastor Joshua, Joshua you're going to attend to them. Repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus. Say, Lord Jesus. I thank you because you died for my sins and you were raised for my glory. Today, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Change me, transform me, reveal yourself to me more than ever before in Jesus' name. I pray for you right now, put up your hands, and may God keep you. May he lead you. May he work in your life. May he deliver you. I see an anointing on you. Power of Holy Ghost. God is going to use you mightily. God delivers you from every spirit of struggle and strife. Today is the beginning of many great things happening in Jesus' name. Amen. Give the Lord a mighty of praise. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. You're going to follow these ushers. The best gift you can give yourself, keep coming to church, okay? Follow them. Want to take your names and numbers. You'll meet a pastor to, to talk to you. The rest of us, I'll see you on Thursday.
carry one person. One. We want the world to hear the message. Carry one person. One person. And say, come and we're going to hear the word. Because our mandate is to see men saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. Okay? So I will see you on Thursday. This broadcast was brought to you by Funero Ministries International. For more information, please visit our website at www.funero.org or download the Funero app to stay up to date with all the ministry programs. The Funero app is available on both Google Play and Apple App Store. Join our online family, spread the love, and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Panero, make manifest.